his red suit, his reindeer in his sleigh. And I'll be home and present for most of Christmas Day. What would Santa say? Yeah.
breath in the air Sending thoughts Oh, the fun When Santa is in his chair Christmas time again Present to be sent Doors are full of shoppers today and so I start with uh, was the I'm sorry was the lesson that we uh, did last Tuesday Christmas so we're going to review that shortly um, for a short time Christmas brings excitement so I initiated the question why does Christmas bring excitement and um, that particular lesson had five bullet points uh, I mentioned today's lesson has four bullet points. A bullet point, if you look down here in your notes toward the bottom of the page, you see that dot before God sent his son. That's a bullet point. It's got a, a dot before the sentence. And, um, and then on the back side, there are three more bullet points. 
And that's what I mean when I say bullet point. Points that were emphasized uh, with a dot before them. So there were uh, some last week, but in the review I don't have them separated out. So why does Christmas bring excitement? Well, I think there were five bullet points in, in the review. There are numbers instead of bullets. Uh, bullet point one was, uh, our number one, God's people looked for the Messiah for centuries. And uh, it makes sense then that since we're on the other side of his coming, Jesus came about 2,000 years ago, a little bit over. And because uh, we're on the Calvary side of the calendar instead of uh, the Old Testament side, we believe the Messiah has come. The Jews are still looking for the Messiah to come. The Christians are looking for him to come again. He's already been here once. And when he comes again, he won't be a meek and mild man. He's going to come to set up a kingdom and thwart everyone who doesn't want him to do that. So that's what he's up to. So we, as Christians, because we believe the Messiah is here, uh, it makes sense for us to follow and him and believe him and worship him. I made a note that was a rule of thumb, meaning there are sometimes exceptions when you say a rule of thumb. It's usually true, but there were two points when it wasn't true. Not a single Old Testament saint witnessed the promised Messiah that is except. And the exceptions include Moses and Elijah. They didn't see Jesus come in the sense... um, walking the earth like uh, the disciples and the others did. But they seen they joined Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when he brought three of the disciples up the mount with them, Peter, John, and James. And Jesus had just said the chapter before, there will be some of you here that will not taste of death until you see me come in my glory. And then the very next chapter starts with the story of the transfiguration. So Jesus takes his three, um, I don't want to say closest disciples, because I'm certain he loved all twelve of them the same, even though one was a betrayer. But the three that he took with him sometimes when he left the others behind. Here up the Mount of Transfiguration, he took three in the Garden of Gethsemane, after he they were down to eleven because Judas left to betray him, he left eight. That all he took all eleven into the garden. He left eight in one spot. Took Peter, John, and James a little further, and then he told them to remain there. And the Bible said he went on about a stone's throw away, which in the Greek means about as far as you could throw a stone. Uh, So Jesus separated himself from the three who had separated themselves from the eight, if you're following me. But those same three go up the Mount of Transfiguration and they see Jesus Christ glorified. Now when he came down off the mount, he looked like he had when he went up the mount. But up on the mountain, there was a time when he radiated glory. And three disciples saw that. And there with Jesus was one of the great miracles of Scripture, Moses and Elijah. Why Moses and Elijah? It appears to me that the two witnesses of the book of Revelation are going to be Elijah and Enoch not Moses and Elijah. And the reason I believe that, it's appointed on the man wants to die. Moses has already died. He doesn't have that appointment ahead of him yet. However, Elijah hadn't died yet. He was taken up to heaven. 
who else in the Bible hadn't died? Only one other guy, Enoch. And he was not, for God took him. So I personally believe that Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Having said that, how come Moses is on the mountain with um, Elijah instead of Enoch? Well, I believe that Moses and uh, Elijah represented the law and the prophets, basically. God's always doing something like that, you know. Uh, represented Moses the law and Elijah prophet. So uh, I, be- I believe there's probably not a lot more to it than, than that thing. So they, uh, at, uh, they witnessed. They don't radiate Moses and Elijah. Peter, John, and James aren't glorified. Only Jesus. But uh, nonetheless, that seemed to be a fulfillment of the verse before because there's no other fulfillment for it found that Jesus said, some of you who are standing here talking to the disciples will not die until you've seen the Son of Man come in His glory. So He gave them a preview, if you please. Sometimes when you go to movies, what do they have before the movies? Previews of coming attractions. I argue this was kind of that. I also argue that the um, seven seals aren't quite like the seven trumpets and the seven vials. They seem to me to be more of previews of coming attractions. When those seals are open, you see a quick glimpse of what the seven years are going to look like. And uh, But anyway, nonetheless... Um, so that's what happened on the mountaintop. And then a second bullet point. God told that Satan and Eve, number two there, uh, or told Satan that Eve's offspring, which is referring to Jesus, would crush him. And there's a verse there that said he will uh, bruise the uh, head up. I mean, he will... Um, he will bite the child foot, but he will crush your head. And so um, the serpent, representing the devil, was going to seemingly win a victory over Christ when Jesus died on the cross. But when he rose again, he in effect destroyed the power of the devil. The third, God promised Abraham that his descendant, singular, would bless the entire earth, talking about Jesus coming through the Jewish family, which were all descendants of Abraham. Jesus the man, Jesus in his humanity, was from the tribe of Judah. He was a, born a Jew. Obviously, if he came to earth, he came as one of God's chosen people, the Jews. Number four, God promised David that his throne would be established forever. The forever hasn't started yet, but when Jesus comes back and sets a up his kingdom on a throne as a descendant of David. Evidently, Israel is going to be honored. Those Jews who are saved are going to have a place of honor. And um, don't don't uh, feel bad about it because the Bible teaches us in Romans uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, we Gentiles, we non-Jews have been grafted in. So uh, we're going to be in that same kingdom with the saved Jews. And Jesus is going to reign as a descendant of David forever and ever. All right. And number five, God spoke over the coming of Jesus to the prophets at least 55 times to one outlet. Another set up to 300 times. But the point that was made, I heard some preacher on the radio just yesterday talk and I think he said 39 times I don't know they all come up with different numbers where they find an Old Testament prophecy fulfilled in the Gospels Um, so let's take the lowest number 39 so 39 times some Old Testament prophet prophesied something about the coming Messiah in the New Testament when it refers to that 
said that this and this happened that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet whichever prophet it was and so the New Testament shows the fulfilling of at least 39 of those prophecies so if that's the case what are the odds of that that someone centuries earlier could have prophesied this and it happened so obviously my brother's an atheist he doesn't believe any of it was fulfilled he believes the whole thing's a fairy tale so he certainly wouldn't believe Mary the virgin but the new gospel account tells us that she is and uh, so here's an Old Testament prophecy that that would happen and then we see it fulfilled in the four gospels especially uh, two of them Matthew and Luke all right, so that uh, the point that was I made there Tuesday was we don't we don't have blind faith. We don't believe just because we believe. We have reason to believe. And when God can prophesy something here, and then centuries later we see it done here, that's reason to believe. And so we are not walking by blind faith. We believe God has proven himself over and over. And I tell you, God's got a different idea of proof than we do. You know what he tells the skeptics, like my brother Jerry, in Romans 1? Look up in the sky at night. The universe speaks of God. As far as God is concerned, and he's the one with whom we have to deal with, as far as he's concerned, you can't deny him if you simply look at the universe on a strength. Yeah. You're without excuse to God. All these scientists that say there's no God, in God's mind, they're without excuse because the universe shows them off. Right. So, anyway, we, we have a lot more than blind faith. This morning's lesson number five. It's the first time I'm going to utilize my bulletin in the lesson. Isn't that a pretty bulletin? Yes, yes. Just so pretty. All right. Christmas is a time for family. So that's the title that Jason gave me to work with for the fifth lesson. Christmas is a time for family. Sometimes I think he put these out and then said, I'm going to see what Dad can do with this. <laughs> Christmas is a time for family. But he took a real interesting twist because we all know that it's time for family. But I asked Google on the, my uh, laptop, why is Christmas more than any other holiday such a time for family? The important, and it came out, again, the new Bing your all-powered co-pilot for the web, ask anything. That's who, uh, I didn't ask Bing, I asked Google, I typed it into Google, but Bing's the one who answered it. You'll have to explain how all that works sometimes. It, but um, anyway, because Google has all of its own services, so I don't know, but Bing has to use Google, right? They use each other. They, they use each other. Well, that's rude. How do computer simpletons like me figure all this out? All right, so here's what Bing said, and I don't mean Crosby. The importance of Christmas for family is that it brings a sense of harmony, closeness, and partnership. It promotes and participates in the magic and wonder that children find in Christmas. It helps each generation get to know the family's values and history. It is a time of love, generosity, sharing, solidarity, and fighting for peace and hope. It's about celebrating, being together, and building memories. So that's Bing's idea of why that's true. Christmas is a time for family. There's more travel over the Christian holiday than any other event, I think, every year. And I had something last week. I don't. I didn't put it down in review. It's over 
billion people on the planet celebrate Christmas. And there is 8 billion, is that right? 8 billion. Now, the reason they're saying that over, because they didn't go around checking houses for Christmas trees. The reason they're saying there's over 2.4 billion people who celebrate Christmas every year is because 2.4 billion people claim to be Christians on this planet. 2.4 2.4 were tied with Muslims. 2.4 billion also claim uh, to be Muslims. So that means that 9.6, I mean uh, 5.6 of the 8 billion are either Christian or Muslim, and both believe in Jesus. But Muslims don't celebrate Christmas. They believe Jesus was a prophet a lesser prophet than Mohammed but they believe he was a prophet the guy who used to run I can't remember his name 20-30 years ago uh, used to be over the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip area he died of old age he went to Egypt I think to be taken care of because he didn't trust that area of the world to take care of him he would go to Bethlehem every Christmas as a Muslim not to celebrate the birth of a savior but the birth of a prophet but today's Muslims and I'm sure back in his day they hate Christians they hate Jews, they want to eradicate the Jews from the planet, but that's the only their second hatred. They get out in the streets and shout that we're the big Satan, America. We're the big Satan, Israel's the little Satan. They hate us, everybody as much. They believe we worship three gods. They worship just Jehovah. They believe Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three gods. And they hate us for that. And they see us as we see them as a cult they see us as a cult and they want to destroy us they pick on Egypt because Egypt I mean they pick on Israel because Israel is smaller than the US but they have the same desire if they ever get nukes and we've had two presidents now trying to help them get nukes Iran they'll die to kill us I want that to think in. They will literally gladly die to kill us. We give them nukes. They're going to immediately shoot at Israel. And then it won't be long after they push those buttons, they push as many buttons as are left, however many nukes they have in America. They hate us. And they'd be willing to die because they think when they die in such a just cause that Jehovah God will give them is it 50 virgins in heaven I think and so they're willing to die to kill you I just want you to know that not all Muslims we got a lot of Americanized Muslims here who want peace Um, but they're all out and most of them are out on the street criticizing Israel right now but anyway so the bottom line is God cares about family and a lot of people around the world believe in Jesus. But half of those believe he's a prophet. The other half of those believe he's God the Son. John 3.16 Now on this first graphic at the bottom of the bulletin I don't have a number because it's not one of the four bullet points. You believe, uh, this is from James. You believe there is one God, that's good. But even the devils believe that, and they shake with fear. You fool, faith that does nothing is worth nothing. Do you want me to prove this to you? So, this is why some say James was, uh, uh, I have no way of knowing this, because I have read people who say something else, but Some say James was the last book of the New Testament uh, agreed upon by those who were trying to figure out which were the anointed books of God to be included in the New Testament. 
And the reason James was the last book is because James says here that faith without works is dead. Paul said, faith justifies you apart from works. Doesn't that sound like two different messages? Paul said, works have nothing to do with your justification. James said, if you don't have works, your faith is useless. And so you can see the conflict. Everybody seemed to agree that all Paul's writings were anointed of God. So they had a hard time with James. The bottom line is there is no disagreement. They're talking about two different categories of work. Paul is talking about the works of the law. Gritting your teeth and trying really hard to be good doesn't justify justify you. Believing that Jesus died to save you, put your faith in him, that's what justifies you. James, on the other hand, believes in the works of faith. In other words, you've heard me say it before, everybody walks out what they believe. Always use my wife when the old Omaha, South Omaha Bridge Road had that narrow, narrow bridge. It scared her to death. Some of those semi-drivers would come over that thing and take over half of that bridge. Yeah, that's true. And uh, then you had to pitch yours in the other portion left, your car, when you uh, were going the other way. Scared her to death. And what you believe produces action, is what James is saying. Faith without a produced action isn't faith. If I believe that bridge isn't safe, I'm going to find another way to get to Omaha. And I always use politics. If I believe that the Democrats are are better for the country than the Republicans, I'm going to vote Democrat. If I believe the Republicans are better for the country... That belief is going to cause me to vote Republican. If I don't vote, I'm neutral. I don't have any belief about that. You can't tell me you think one party is better for the country than the other and not show up to vote. That's what James is saying. Faith without works, without action. If it doesn't produce a corresponding action in you, you can tell me all day that you believe this. But nothing comes from it. It's a lie, and that's what James is saying. So he's saying, the devils believe he exists. Whoopee! They're scared to death of him. All right? So faith without works is dead. Now, God sent his son, bullet point one. And so obviously in the bulletin, um, the initial way he sent it, the son, if you go in your bulletin, I just put down some words. God did not send, uh, verse 17 of John, right after verse 16, obviously. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. So uh, that's a modern translation. I'm not familiar with TPT. I'll have to find out what that is. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it's pretty much in standard with the King James on that verse. Uh, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved is the King James Version. So, uh, God sent his son to rescue us, not condemn us, is what that verse is saying. So, where it said God sent his son, I use that particular one, Uh, to illustrate bullet point one. He sent his son. The reason I didn't use it about his birth because he's got another bullet point that's talking about giving him a mother. And so I I use this verse for the bullet point for number one. All right, now, John 3.16, we all know that when God so loved the world. Uh, But that's going to be bullet point four, so we'll leave that for right now. Flip it over. Luke 2, 4 to 7 is a story of the baby being born. Verse 7, she gave birth to her first son. So God sent his son into the world, 
but didn't send him as a full grown man sent him as a baby and I always tell you before Jesus did this thing where Philippian 2 said he humbled himself and became obedient it was humiliating when you think of humbling he humiliated himself and he went from one moment filling the universe everywhere there was a star everywhere there was anything in space he was there everywhere scripture said he held he holds the universe together with the power of his word I'm assuming our father in heaven took that over the Holy Spirit might have won, but doesn't tell us who took that over maybe Jesus kept doing it maybe that wasn't one of the privileges he laid aside we don't know but he spent nine months in the belly of a woman and I, I always emphasize that I want people to get this picture you're everywhere I mean everywhere and everywhere is a whole lot bigger than we think it is. I think everybody agrees those universes beyond these universes, right? It just is ever extending. We don't know. And um, but he was he was everywhere, and is everywhere. And there might have been a thirty-three year gap in that when it wasn't him that was holding all that together. It was someone else. But nonetheless because he's part of God and God is omnipresent meaning he's everywhere he went from being everywhere laid some privileges aside and spent nine months in the womb as God prepared a body for him uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing story and uh, So I put down for bullet point two, Luke 1, 30 and 31. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth the Son, and that shall call his name Jesus. So first, God sent his Son to earth to become man, to become human. And then, he gave that human a mother. Now the mother, obviously Mary, didn't know a whole lot that was going on. I mean, the angel Gabriel told her stuff that had never been told to any human before. You're going to get pregnant. And she said, how can that be? I know no man. I'm not in re relationship with a man, certainly not in that kind of a relationship with a man. How can I get pregnant? And the angel said, this thing the Holy Ghost is going to descend upon you and create it in you. It's an amazing story. And she finally said, do unto your handmaiden whatever pleases you. Can you imagine how scary that whole thing would be? Anyway, um, it's an amazing story. I won't get sidetracked too much to talk about the humiliation that she faced. Getting bigger and bigger. But it appears, initially, big enough where Joseph knew she was pregnant and wanted to put her away. But it appears that Joseph took her as a wife the minute the angel spoke to him in a dream. He got married. And so when the New Testament says that she was a virgin, uh, they use the word... Uh, of Joseph there as being engaged to her some of the commentaries they read believe what that is saying is they're saying that he's engaged even though he married her by that time to strengthen the idea that this was a virgin birth there was no man whatsoever involved with this birth it was totally done by the Holy Spirit descending on a woman and mir miraculously creating a fetus so he gave this child he sends had to have a mother to fulfill the mission so he gave her a mother and then 
point three chose a stepfather form. Now, I couldn't find a verse I liked for a while, so I just found a graphic. Uh, number three, Joseph, the man who raised Jesus. And that's basically who he is. And right above the H, doesn't sh point, uh, the, the coloring's kind of dark there, so the three doesn't show out as well as it could, but it's right above the H. So that is bullet point three, God giving him a stepfather. And the stepfather evidently taught him carpentry. Joseph was a carpenter. And uh, evidently, I mean, certainly we can't prove it categorically from Scripture, but it seems he knew some of the trade of his father. Remember, he was 30 before God called him out to start doing his thing, performing miracles, calling disciples. We don't know when Joseph died, but Joseph was dead by that time. And uh, it seems that Jesus was probably supporting his mother uh, through carpentry. And this is all conjecture, but that's what it appears. Uh, back in those days, dads taught their children how to do something that could bring money in. My dad never did that. Come think of it, he never taught me nothing. All right. Now, so there, there's some uh, bold proof uh, under bullet three. Chose a stepfather. There's the verse that talks about how he talked to Joseph. And, um, you know, I put in here up above when it shows a, a mother. In Luke 1, 28 to 31 above. Under verse 31, I have a note. We aren't told why, out of all the women in the world, God chose Mary. The scripture doesn't tell us that. But, Ephesians 1, 11 tells us this. Paul writing about all the things God has done for us, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him, listen now, who work, worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. So why did God choose Mary out of every woman in the world? Because He wanted to. It was His will. It's what He wanted to do. Now the good news is, God is God and He'll always do what He wants to do. And I put a little note in here. Here's the good news to you and I concerning that. He'll never do anything contrary to His nature. God's not one day going to get mad at this church and just squash everybody. God's not going to do that because that's not His nature. We're hid in Christ in God, the Scripture says. God the Father on my worst day cannot look at me except through the prism of His Son Jesus. And in Christ I am clean. So His nature is to bless me, not curse me. So everything God does will be according to what He wants to do, but it will also fall in line with who He is. He will never act out of character. And then we get the same thing in Matthew 1 where he chooses the stepfather Joseph and we could ask the same question. We aren't told why out of all the men in the world God told Joseph. But I assume he did so for the very same reason he chose Mary. He wanted to. Why did he choose Moses? Why did he choose Elijah, Elisha? Why did he save you? And he wanted to. Now he wants to save some people that he won't save because he will not work against that individual's will. If you choose not to follow God, he'll honor that in the sense that he won't make you follow him. And then bulletproof, bulletproof, bullet number four. Well, this is kind of a bulletproof one. God gave you a way to be grafted or adopted 
into his family. And there are a lot of things, again, here on the front of the bulletin. Um, he, he didn't send... No, that's the... Uh, uh, inside the bulletin, bullet one. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and to rescue it. So, he gave me a way. And verses 16 and 17 of John are as good as any that explain what that way is. Again, the two together. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The first few words of verse 18. He that believeth not is condemned already. There's absolutely no doubt in the Scripture. Everything is about faith and believing God. Whosoever believeth shall not perish. He that believeth not is condemned already. I want to be in this group. He that believeth shall not perish. I don't want to be in this group. He that believeth not is condemned already. So, what is the way for me to get into the family of God? Of course, on the back, underneath um, the YouTube information, I got the most famous verse in all the Bible there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And it tells me how to get involved. How to get into the family of God. How to be born again. And that's to put my faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. I can't earn my way to heaven. I could be the best man outside of Jesus this world has ever seen and go to hell. I could do everything right according to my fellow humans. They could think I'm all that and then some. They might form long lines to come up and squeeze my cheek. And if I don't know Jesus, I'm going to hell. So God gave me a way to get into the family of God. So let's look at the last part of these notes. God so loved the world, we did that. The Amplified really wants you to see this. On the, um, amplified, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten, unique son, so that whosoever believes in, and this is what that means in the Greek, trust in, clings to, relies on him shall not perish that is come to destruction, be lost but have eternal meaning everlasting life. So, I put that there because look at what James 19 says. Verses 19 and 20 of James chapter 2. Are there still some among you who hold that only believing is enough? Believing in one God? Well, remember that the demons believe that this too so strongly that they tremble in terror. Fool, verse 20, when you will learn that believing is useless without doing what God wants you to do. Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith. So I have a closing note. True faith is a decision to follow Christ, not just to admit he exists. <coughs> I understand, as a Christian, I understand he's God, I'm not. Jesus told me to pick up my cross and follow him. He picked up a cross for me and followed his Father all the way to Calvary. Did you know that God the Father was at Calvary? The scripture said God was in Christ. When Jesus was dying, God was right there. There's no separation in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were all there. Jesus was physically feeling it because he had been clothed with a human body with physical feelings. But I guarantee you, God the Holy Spirit and God the Father were emotionally feeling it like we can't believe. And then God the Father had to do something that was probably the hardest thing he ever did in eternity. When all the sins of the world were placed on that 
frail human body on the cross God the Father had to look the other way and Jesus said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me I don't know how long that separation lasted but for the eternal Jesus it had never happened before for the eternal Father it had never happened before and I'm sure it felt like an eternity might have just been a few moments but he had to turn away I'm assuming once all the sins were weighed on him and this is a guess he had to turn away till Jesus died because it was the death of Christ that paid for my sins and then the sins were removed and son and father were reunited would be my guess how that worked we're not given more clarity but that certainly would be my guess so God has a family and guess what I'm in it would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me and family is important to God. oh I wanted to uh, share with you one other thing um, Rome I mean um, yeah Romans chapter 8 let me see if it's still there Romans chapter 8 I want to read to you an amazing verse in closing. All right, get ready for this. This really excites me. Romans 8, 28, you're all familiar with. And we know that all things work together for good of them that love God to them or the called according to his purpose. Now listen up. Verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate or predetermine that we would be conformed to the image of his Son. How come? You ready for this? That he might, Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren or many children. God did all this because he wanted more children. Is that incredible or what? God went through all that he went through in the giving of his son and watching his son die because he wanted you and his family. Jesus was the firstborn of many children. You might say that my God is a family man and he's got more children than any father, other father has ever had, obviously. 